broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. My name is Natalie Tamir. I'm a program analyst on the buildings team at World Resources Institute. I will provide a very brief introduction of the work of the BEA and the bulk of the time today, we will hear from Carolyn Zoom of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab on implementing a quick wins building energy performance improvement strategy. We hope you'll stay with us for critical questions at the end, which you can submit at any point throughout today's presentation in the questions box. We have a lot of content to get through, so we're hoping to um, keep questions succinct but very focused, and if there's any that we don't get a chance to get to in the discussion today, we will certainly um, share those questions with Carolyn and her team for you to be in contact with after the presentation. The BEA is a platform of 55 cities in 25 countries all around the world. We've been in operation since 2015 as part of the UN Sustainable Energy for All platform. We also now have three national subnational engagements as while we focus on city actions, we recognize there are barriers to city action without national action. The BEA has focused for five years on building a platform where cities and states can improve the policy environments and programs they have around building energy efficiency. The, the platform provides an opportunity for global learning across peer cities, as well as regional learnings through deep dive city work and regional lead organizations that convene actors across the region. To support those cities around the world, we have over 50 global partners, including multilaterals, private sector companies, and nonprofit organizations. The BEA is a public-private program, and we're looking to use policy and programs to transform the market for energy efficient and high performance performing buildings. The BEA provides a number of tools to cities who join. We help decision makers to prioritize and track which actions they'd like to pursue. We provide tools, expertise, and solutions to better and more quickly achieve those goals. We aim to connect projects to financing and funding opportunities and serve as an avenue for international recognition and collaboration. For technical assistance, we provide four main levels. Deep engagement in approximately 10 cities in three countries, direct technical assistance in a targeted way to help cities overcome specific barriers or obstacles. Through our platform, we have a peer learning network to help cities connect to each other and learn from one another's experiences. And the most general, playbooks, focus on building energy codes retrofits and targets. These topics were chosen based on the interests of cities, providing step-by-step -step guidance for cities on where to start, and they walk them through actions of implementation. The <clears throat> Better Tool provides a step-by-step -step guidance to local governments on how to develop and implement voluntary existing building energy efficiency targets. It points to several case studies, including Shanghai's Changning District's successful implementation. Okay, to get to Better, the reason we're here today, Better is an open source, easy to use tool targeting energy efficiency improvements by turning readily available monthly energy consumption data into specific cost-effective recommendations for improvements. The BEA has been delighted to help test, pilot, and deploy this tool across our network. And we are grateful for Carolyn being here today to present it. So with that, I pass it on to Carolyn to walk us through implementing quick wins, building energy performance improvement strategy in better. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. My pleasure, Carolyn, it's all you.
Okay. Um, so thank you, Natalie, so much for that wonderful introduction to the Building Efficiency Accelerator. As indicated, I'm going to present today implementing quick wins for building energy performance improvement and communicating success. Today's presentation will do a quick review of the building efficiency targeting tool for energy retrofits for those who may be less familiar with the web application. Then we'll talk about general challenges and opportunities to building energy efficiency, performance improvement. I'll introduce some case studies of buildings and portfolios around the world that have improved energy performance through simple no-cost, low-cost operational energy performance measures. I'll talk briefly about general guidelines for energy management and then do a deep dive on some of the no cost, low cost energy efficiency performance measures recommended by Better. We'll talk about using an operations checklist that Natalie will circulate after today's webinar to support buildings, portfolios, cities, et cetera, in implementing quick wins after using the Better tool. We'll talk briefly about how to leverage better to procure energy services, some tips on securing contracts, financing, et cetera. And then very importantly, communicating your in terms that will resonate with internal and external audiences. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge Johnson Controls, who provided valuable intellectual property to Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to develop the building efficiency targeting tool for energy retrofits. I'd also like to thank ICF International, who supported early stage development and validation of BETTER. The training that I'm going to present today is derived from a US agency for international development, US-China Sustainable Partnership, Building Partnership training. We've delivered this training to more than 8,000 buildings and helped reduce energy consumption by an estimated 3.4 terawatt hours, saving 465 million in energy costs and reducing carbon dioxide emissions equivalent to 2.8 million metric tons of CO2e. Getting started. As professionals in the building energy performance space, many of us are aware of the challenges we face related to global surface temperature rise. According to the 2015 Paris Agreement, we aim to keep global surface temperature rise well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels by the end of the 21st century. The building sector is the largest source of primary energy consumption, about 40%, and ranks second after the industrial sector as a global source of direct and indirect CO2 emissions from fuel combustion. <clears throat> However, according to the World Economic Forum, about one half of all energy consumed by buildings could be avoided with new energy efficient systems and equipment. Within that context, we're introducing the better tool, providing commercial building owners, managers, and service providers worldwide with an easy to use tool to target efficiency improvements by turning readily available building information and monthly energy data into energy efficiency interventions, both operational and technological, at the building and portfolio levels. Importantly, BETTER doesn't replace an audit, but it's a preliminary screening and targeting tool to provide an estimate of the size and makeup of potential energy efficiency projects in buildings that can be deployed without having to set foot in these buildings or hire expensive outside contractors. BETTER is highly scalable and used to target efficiency opportunities in one or many buildings simultaneously. BETTER is not a rating tool and does not provide a score or path to certification and is intended to complement and interact with DOE's existing tools such as Energy Star Portfolio Manager, the Asset Score, Building Sync, or the Standard Energy Efficiency Data Platform. We first introduced Better into the marketplace in Earth, on Earth Day 2019. And a few highlights of this alpha version of the tool included copyrighted web-based tool available publicly at the URL shown on the upper left, an open source analytical engine with its code published on GitHub. Again, the, the, uh, the URL for that code is in the upper left-hand corner. Under an open source software license, 
software developers can download, redistribute, and redevelop better source code, um, sharing, sharing those code improvements both with the development team at Berkeley Lab and on GitHub to support improvements and enhancements to the tool. Better is applicable globally. Any building anywhere in the world where there is heating and cooling equipment within the building and also energy consumption is sensitive to changes in weather condition can derive meaningful information from the Better tool. Better runs using readily available monthly energy usage data, building size, location, and type. It automatically regresses monthly electricity and fossil fuel usage versus ambient temperatures. Benchmarks five regression model coefficients, which you can see there on the right. And with this information quantifies energy and cost savings potential at the building and portfolio level. And then recommends measurable action-oriented energy efficiency interventions, both operational and technological at the building and portfolio level. Better also provides flexible savings targets that provide users with several options to improve energy efficiency, aggressive energy efficiency savings, conservative or more nominal energy savings. The beta version of Better was just released a few weeks ago by Lawrence Berkeley and Johnson Controls. This version of Better goes a little bit beyond what we released about a year ago. We have built-in reference benchmark statistics for US offices. We've also enhanced our coordination and um, interoperability with the Energy Star Portfolio Manager tool, allowing users of Energy Star Portfolio Manager to auto-generate Excel-based reports that contain all data necessary to run analysis using Better. Users of Portfolio Manager can auto-generate those Excel reports and automatically upload those to Better to allow them to quantify the energy and cost savings potential and pinpoint the energy efficiency measures necessary to achieve higher levels of energy performance in their buildings. We've also reduced the runtime due to a unique parallel inverse model process for large portfolios, incorporated estimated greenhouse gas emission intensity and reduction potential, in particular to support um, emerging high performance building standards in cities such as Washington DC and New York City. And under development is a RESTful application programming interface that allows users to exchange data with Better and receive and incorporate our metrics into their existing software platforms and tools. For more information about Better and video tutorials on how to use Better, please go to the URL shown on the slide. Today's presentation is going to focus more on what happens and what do you do after you've benchmarked and analyzed buildings using better, you've quantified your energy and cost savings potential, and you've determined the energy efficiency recommendations for your building and your portfolio. So a little bit of context. What, what is an energy efficient building? This is really an important question. In, in our view, green, high-performance buildings, new construction are important. You can see there on the left side of this graphic, green buildings, um, high-performance buildings, net zero energy buildings, net zero carbon buildings, extremely important. They're newsworthy, but they're also costly. Um, in the big picture, green really happens once a building is constructed and being operated, savings over time can become a very powerful story to tell about energy performance in buildings. So for us, green really happens after a building is designed and built, and it's all about efficient operations. The focus of today's presentation is derived from early findings from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Energy Star program, where analysis showed that the mix of buildings, excuse me, the mix of technologies in Energy Star certified buildings, which are on average 35% to 40% more efficient than average U.S. buildings, their mix of technologies is similar to average and below average U.S. buildings. 
So this is fascinating. The technologies in our best performing buildings in the US and those that are average or below average are the same. What the studies show was that the buildings that earned the Energy Star certification had in place careful operations and maintenance programs and a strong commitment to energy performance improvement. What this tells us is that technology may not be the first place to look for energy cost and greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Buildings, even with less efficient mechanical systems and building materials, can still achieve energy savings and high performance. Moreover, buildings with all of the right equipment can still be operated inefficiently. Lastly, an important component to this is that portfolio interventions, when we're thinking about improving performance of 10, 20, 100 buildings, may not resemble how we would approach single building energy performance improvement. So a few challenges that we face collectively when we think about improving building energy performance at speed and scale. What is really, what is really precluded the, the marketplace from moving quickly and quickly on these challenges is first and foremost, a lack of equitable building energy performance benchmarks, which would tell the marketplace what's good, typical and poor. Of course, we see these emerging, the better tool um, is doing this. Um, we think this is important. The more widespread that tool becomes, um, the more familiar the marketplace in general gets with good, typical and poor performance for different aspects of building energy consumption. A second, generally, a lack of energy usage knowledge precludes action on energy performance improvement. Um, again, building operators tend to be unfamiliar with how much of their building's annual energy usage costs go to heating, cooling, and base load, and have little sense of where potential cost savings would come from. Through better, again, we're trying to address this problem. Third, a lack of guidance in the marketplace. There tends to still be an emphasis on technology sales, less emphasis on whole buildings and system improvements, and of course less emphasis on building portfolios and action that can be implemented across portfolios. Finally, large capital investments are unattractive. Building operators, owners aren't often interested in making capital in investments due to difficulties obtaining financing, lack of information on financial returns, and reluctance to replace existing equipment. And a lot of these findings um, we, we obtained through field work in Brazil, Philippines, Mexico, China. So these are, these are sort of worldwide challenges. I'm now gonna talk about a few case studies. These are examples of buildings that within the context of some of these challenges have achieved significant energy and cost savings. So the first case study comes from the United States, it's the Boston Edison corporate office. Um, this is a, a portfolio of three buildings, about 21,000 square meters. These buildings are quite old, 13 to 38 years old. And the owners implemented 12 no cost or low cost operations and maintenance measures. I'll talk about a few of those. Buildings implemented improvements around lighting, scheduling equipment and lights. They turned off their direct expansion, air conditioning units, fans and pumps after work hours. Very simple. Trained employees to use the lighting control systems to light in use areas only and reminded staff to turn off their computers and printers at night. All no cost um, operational improvements save them $80, $86,000 annually in energy costs, about 9.6%, and an immediate payback. Secondly, Boston Edison corporate office adjusted economizer settings in their HVAC system. They used enthalpy instead of dew point to determine the economizer changeover. They changed the algorithm in their BAS to allow economizing below 22 degrees dry bulb and less than 25 BTU per pound enthalpy. This resulted in 714 hours of additional economizing annually. The cost to implement was zero 
annual energy cost savings were $22,000 or 2.5%, and the payback was immediate. The third measure implemented by Boston Corporate Edison, excuse me, Boston Edison Corporate Office was resetting static pressure. They programmed the static reset sequence based on the condition of their variable air volume boxes as follows. Automatically checked all boxes every five minutes. If none were greater than 95% open, they would reduce static pressure set points by 7%. If one or more boxes were greater than 95% open, they would increase static pressure set point by 7%. If one or more boxes was equal to 95% and none were greater than 95%, they took no action. This no-cost measure achieved annual energy cost savings of around 9,700 US dollars, and again, the payback was immediate. So those were a few of the measures taken by this corporate office building in Boston. Total overall project savings were roughly 157,000 US dollars. The cost to implement was 2,500 US dollars. This was 17.6% annual savings and a payback of uh, less than less than a quarter of a year. Um, I'm now going to talk about a building in um, Shanghai, Urban Hotel. I love this case study because Urban Hotel um, is a fantastic boutique hotel in downtown Shanghai, and it became the first carbon neutral hotel in Shanghai, and perhaps even in China, through the purchase of carbon offsets from local green energy projects. So this group was intending to design and operate high performance green building. They included many eco-friendly features in their space, including recycled, using recycled and locally sourced building materials, such as reclaimed Shanghai hardwood and brick. They used passive solar shading, double pane windows, low VOC paints, and low wattage lighting. So they implemented a lot of these groundbreaking and important green um, technologies. However, when we walked through um, urban, urban hotel in Shanghai, we identified a number of ways that this building could improve its energy performance and cut down on its operating costs. Um, urban hotel Shanghai was a four, had a four pipe system, which allowed for both heating and cooling to be running simultaneously in the building. So we worked with them to analyze past energy consumption data to identify those swing seasons and develop a schedule for when both cooling and heating may be necessary within a 24-hour period. Otherwise, the building would run either heating or cooling, cutting down on energy consumption. We also work with them on coil temperature reset, so to manually reset the chiller coil temperature approximately every 10 days, so that chiller coil temperatures were not lower than required to meet building cooling loads, thereby wasting electricity. Also guest room temperature management. This was a five-star boutique hotel, uh, but we worked with the facility staff to adjust the thermostat range on guest room temperatures to a minimum of 22 degrees Celsius in summer and a maximum of 26 degrees Celsius in winter. No guest complaints and a lot of energy savings. In addition, um, very simple measure, urban hotel facility management team started to clean their HVAC coils and filters. They now regularly remove dust and dirt from those filters and heating and cooling coils, significantly saving energy usage and costs. Also high hallway lighting. We adjusted the operation time of hallway lights and some toilet water saving measures. So reducing water levels in guest toilets so flushing would consume less water, but still meet guest standards. As a result, Urban Hotel saved 36% in its electricity usage. They implemented eight no-cost O&M measures, and in just six months of implementation, they saved $20,744 US dollars in electricity costs and about $1,000 US dollars in water costs. Um, so what's, what this shows really is even green, high-performance building can find ways to save energy usage and costs through these no-cost, low-cost O&M measures. Lastly is Seville's, a brand you may be familiar with. Um, they worked at a portfolio level to reduce annual energy usage by around 10%. Seville's is a leading international property services group. Um, they partnered with the USAID program a while back. They took actions, including training 60 of their Seville, Seville, excuse me, Seville's Beijing property managers who managed about 
200 buildings with a total floor space of 4 million square meters. We worked with them to conduct site assessments for pilot buildings to identify appropriate no cost, low cost opportunities that could be implemented across the portfolio. Based on those assessments, Seville's buildings started to collect, analyze, display, and share energy performance data. They corrected overlit conditions. They utilized pre-cooling strategies, and they cleaned coils and filters at least once per month. They operated their buildings at slight positive pressure. They reset their coil temperature and promoted tenant awareness. Implementing those measures helped them save 10% across their portfolio, energy savings of more than 100 million kilowatt hours annually, as well as emissions reductions equivalent to planting 2.0 billion new trees annually. So what have we learned here? All buildings can save energy and money by practicing careful operations and maintenance. Buildings with new green equipment can still be operated inefficiently, and certain approaches can be applied to an entire portfolio and produce more savings than focusing on each building individually. So guidelines for energy management. These next, few <laughs> these next few slides, I'm going to move through rather quickly. These are general guidelines, and I think important for any building or portfolio operator to be aware of. These guidelines come from the US Environmental Protection Agency Energy Star Program, and they're kind of a general roadmap and a proven strategy for superior energy management in buildings. The steps include making a commitment, assessing performance, setting goals, creating an action plan, implementing that action plan, evaluating progress, and recognizing achievements. Committing to continuous improvement. Organizations seeing the financial returns from superior energy management continuously striving to improve energy, energy, building energy efficiency. Success really here is based on regularly accessing the energy performance and implementing steps to increase energy efficiency. When first establishing an energy, energy program, leading organizations need to form dedicated energy teams and institute energy policies. Point an energy director, establish a team that will help develop and implement strategies across an organization and institute a policy. All of these provide a strong foundation for achieving energy performance improvement goals. A second step is assessing performance. And again, this is where the better tool and other similar tools can come into, come into play. Understand current and past energy usage, And on a periodic, excuse me, and routinely assess performance through, excuse me, and, and assessing performance through evaluating energy use for all major facilities and functions in the organization, including establishing a baseline or critical aspects of this performance assessment. Again, gather and track data, baseline and benchmark, analyze and evaluate performance improvements. Thirdly is to set performance goals. Performance goals drive energy management activities and promote continuous improvement. These goals should be clear and measurable. Moreover, they should be aligned with effective strategies and ensure that these strategies deliver both environmental and financial improvements. To develop effective performance goals, determine, determine scope, estimate potential for improvement, and create, express, and create and express clear measurable targets with dates for the entire organization or facility or other units. Creating an action plan, key steps include defining technical steps and targets and determining the roles and available resources to implement that plan. Step five, implementing an action plan. People can make or break an energy program, it's important to gain the support and cooperation of key people at different levels within an organization in order to have a successful program. In addition, reaching goals are frequently dependent on the awareness, commitment, and capability of the people who implement the projects. 
To implement an action plan, consider the following steps. Create a communications plan, raise awareness, build capacity, motivate and track and monitor, and excuse me, use the tracking system, use a tracking system such as better as part of an action plan to track and monitor progress on a regular basis. Step six, evaluate progress. Evaluating progress includes both formal review, excuse, includes formal review, both energy use data and the activities carried out as part of the action plan as compared to your performance goals. Evaluating results and information gathered during the formal process is used by many organizations to create new action plans, identify new practices, and set new performance goals. Measure your results, compare current performance to established goals, and review your action plan regularly. Understand what worked well and what didn't in order to identify the best practices. Finally, recognize achievements. Providing and seeking recognition for energy management achievement is a proven step for sustaining momentum and support for energy management programs. Providing recognition to those who have helped the organization achieve these results motivates staff and employees and brings positive exposure to the energy management program. Receiving recognition from outside sources validates the importance of the energy management program to both internal and external stakeholders and provides positive positive exposure for the organization as a whole. Key steps in providing and gaining recognition include providing internal recognition to teams, individuals, facilities within your organization, and receiving external recognition from government agencies, the media, and other third-party organizations. So I went through that rather quickly and at a high level and now I'd like to dive into how to implement BETTER's no-cost, low-cost energy efficiency recommendations. For those of you who've used BETTER, you're aware that BETTER provides important analytical output reports. These include reports at a portfolio level, which summarize overall portfolio energy performance, energy and cost savings potential, and benchmark one building against another in terms of its energy use intensity and energy cost savings potential. Better also provides single building analysis reports. So on a building by building basis, recommends, identifies energy and cost savings potential and recommends specific energy performance improvement measures to capture those savings. Additional important information related to energy consumption trends, current, and what can be achieved through implementation of operation, operational improvement measures, as well as weather sensitivity and benchmarks are available as part of these single building analytical output reports. Once you've taken a look at these output reports, two key pieces of information can be gleaned. The first include a portfolio's top energy efficiency recommendations. These are the top five or six energy efficiency improvement measures that are most frequently recommended across a large portfolio of buildings. You can see here reduced equipment schedules, reduced lighting loads, reduced plug loads, decreased heating set points, and increased cooling set points. Better also tells you how many buildings out of your entire portfolio should be implementing these measures to improve performance. By opening, by clicking on these links, additional information appears within the Better tool, a brief description of the measure and some resources that can help you implement that measure. On a building by building basis, Better also provides energy efficiency recommendations as shown in the upper right hand corner here. By clicking on the details button, again, you get additional information, a brief description, on the measure and some resources to support implementation. In today's webinar, we're really gonna focus on that stepwise guidance, how to implement these measures. Currently, BETTER offers 14 categories of energy efficiency improvements. You can see those on the right-hand side of this graphic. From those 14 measures, we've derived 20 plus no-cost, low-cost O&M energy efficiency improvement measures. In the category of reducing equipment schedules, we'll talk about carefully controlling equipment operating schedules. In the reduced lighting load category, there are about five measures, correcting overlit conditions, installing occupancy sensors, 
taking advantage of daylight with photo sensors, dimming control, and use of energy efficient lamps. Category three is reducing plug loads. We'll talk about turning off office equipment using smart outlet outlets. Category four is decreasing infiltration. We'll talk about operating buildings at a slight positive pressure. Step five, or category five, has to do with adding and fixing economizers, which allow for use of night pre-cooling, pre-cooling, and also the importance of cleaning and repairing outside air dampers and bird screens. Category six is optimizing heating and cooling set points, resetting chiller coil temperatures, setting limits on room thermostats and resetting condenser water temperature. Lastly, category seven is increasing heating and cooling system efficiency. And there are about eight measures here, heating and cooling system use, cleaning your HVAC coils and filters, inspecting and repairing insulation of pipes, inspecting and repairing duct leaks, closing bipal valves tightly, improving cooling tower evaporator maintenance, regulating your boiler operation, and treating boiler water. We'll do our, get, our best to get through all of these today, but because of the time limits, we may not be able to go in depth on each and every one of them, but Natalie is gonna circulate the slides after today's webinar so you can review these and then begin implementing. So to start out, reducing equipment schedules. This one is really easy. Um, it's important to carefully control equipment operating, operating schedules. So partially occupied periods, such as nights and weekends, may present some unique challenges uh, to control these equipment operating schedules. Some strategies we've seen work include requiring that occupants request after hours building services. So they need to request it versus having it be automatically provided. Occupant agreements to pay extra for our after hours services and reorganizing spaces to improve control of partial occupancy and variable occupancy spaces. We also recommend utilizing a checklist and assigning equipment scheduling staff to specific facility staff whereby they can get familiar with how often various equipment needs to be on and operating to support building occupancy needs. Also utilizing the BAS to control equipment and building systems based on the designated schedule. Reducing lighting load. So here we've got five really important measures that can go a long way in saving energy usage and costs as we saw in the Boston Edison uh, corporate case study. So correct overlit conditions. Why do we need to do this? Even high efficiency lights can waste energy. Occupants prefer oftentimes to reduce lighting levels versus having very bright, bright lights. And worker productivity improves when lighting is optimal. So how do we assess this opportunity in a building? We need to ask the following questions. Have lighting levels ever been measured in this building? Have lighting levels been compared to recommended levels? Do most documents just sit in front of their computers all day and are lighting levels adjustable. Using a very inexpensive digital light meter as shown in the lower left can support facilities teams both in measuring light levels and setting optimum light, light levels. These light meters can retail for as little as $20 US. The following chart shows recommended light levels for various types of spaces. Offices that are private and closed, require about 300 to 500 lux of energy, excuse me, of lighting. Offices that are open, it's about the same amount. Corridors, much lower lighting, rep, lighting levels are recommended and so on. So strategies that we recommend to correct overlit conditions include delamping, which is removing lamps within a fixture to meet recommended light lamp levels, lamp and or ballast replacement, selecting the best ballast, or lamp configuration for a given space to meet recommended levels, fixture replacement, which is switching to optimal number and type of fixtures when originals need replacement or during occupant turnover, and installing individual lighting controls, which allow occupants to dim or switch lighting levels in individual workspaces. Key steps to correct lighting levels include measuring light levels of workspaces, 
Again, those simple light meters can retail for as little as $20 US. Compare light measurements with standards to identify overlit or underlit conditions. Consult with fixture ballast and lamp vendors to identify options for adjusting those light levels. Consider whether individual task lights can be added, reduced, or reduced, uh, excuse me, can be added, reducing the need for ceiling lights. Calculate estimated savings, compare future savings with the cost of implementing the measure, and develop prototype spaces. A second component of reducing lighting loads is installing occupancy sensors. There are different types of sensors, passive infrared sensors, which detect occupants' body heat in a room, ultrasonic sensors, which use high-frequency sounds to detect motion, even around corners, and dual technology sensors, which use, both method, which use both methods, increasing accuracy and flexibility. So select a sensor type based upon the lighting usage patterns, the room or area type, and pay attention to proper placement and orientation. Don't block the sensor with furniture and place sensor so that it has access to the entire room but does not include extra spaces. Occupancy sensors are best suited for areas with intermittent occupancy, such as mail rooms or restrooms, areas that are unoccupied for long periods of time, vacant offices, storage rooms, computer rooms. Also commission and calibrate lighting controls and sensors regularly to maintain energy savings. If occupancy sensors are too sensitive, they're gonna to fail to save energy. If they're not sensitive enough, they'll upset occupants. Use sensors in combination with the BAS, lighting controls, and rely on occupancy sensors during work hours and allow the BAS to turn off or dim lighting during unoccupied times. Industry estimates of energy savings potential from occupancy sensors are shown on this slide. Occupancy sensors costs are very minimal, ranging from about $30 to $130 per sensor, depending on the type. Reducing lighting load also involves taking advantage of daylight with photosensors. A photosensor is a technology that adjusts the light output of a lighting system based on the amount of daylight it senses. Installing photosensors in areas that are exposed to daylight, such as private offices, workstations, corridors, atriums or lobbies, any spaces that are near windows or skylights, can help save energy in a building. Buildings should use photosensors in combination with the BAS, BAS lighting controls and rely on these sensors during daytime hours to allow the BAS to turn off or dim lighting both at night and during the day. Installing photosensors and dimming ballasts that adjust based on the sensor's readings, commission and calibrate these photosensors and controls and regularly recalibrate, recalibrate lighting controls to maintain energy savings and satisfy occupant needs. Quality photo sensors, again, cost less than 100 US dollars um, in, a, in a retail setting. Take advantage of daylighting with photo sensors. The following are potential strategies that can help, that can be applied in combination to achieve savings. Private offices can achieve the highest savings potential through use of occupancy and pretty good savings through time scheduling and photo sensors. Those open, office, those open offices with a lot of daylight can make use of all three of these strategies, occupancy sensors, time scheduling, photo sensors, to achieve very high savings. Open office interior, again, occupancy sensors and time scheduling can achieve very high uh, very high savings. Another strategy to take into account when seeking to improve and reduce lighting load is use of dimming control. Dimming controls reduce the output and energy consumption of light sources. You can see on the right hand side of this graph a wall mountable wireless dimmer switch which retails for less than $25. Compared to just on off controls, these dimmers can increase energy savings better aligning lighting with the occupant needs and lengthen the lamp life. When combined with photosensors that measure local light levels, dimming controls can 
correct for dirt buildup and fixtures and lamp lumen depreciation. Dimming controls are also used to moderate, modulate lamp output to account for incoming daylight. Dimming may be used also to accomplish, excuse me, dimming may be accomplished in either a stepped or continuous fashion. So step dimming involves putting lamps on different switching circuits. You can see in the diagram on the right, this is a classroom. There are two switches. By turning switch one on, the classroom podium area can be bright with the room itself rather dim or dark. By switching on light number two, the podium area goes dark and the room itself is lit up. By switching both one and two on, you get a bright podium and a bright room. So that's an example of step dimming. Apply ballast designed specifically for step, step dimming. This again allows for two or three different lighting levels that can be used in combination with occupancy sensors and especially used for, useful for high intensity discharge lamps. The other approach mentioned is continuous dimming. And you can see in the right lower corner there a photo. You're probably familiar with those types of dimmers that kind of gradually allow for an increase in lighting levels to 100% brightness um, and a gradual decline to maybe 50, 40, 20% brightness. Um, so continuous dimming allows for adjusting lighting levels over a wide range. It's more flexible than step dimming and can be used in a wide variety of applications, including mood setting, daylight dimming, often used with fluorescent lamps to reduce electric power light output whenever daylight is unavailable. Please do note that the ballasts are not compatible with all dimmers. However, so ballast and dimmer should be checked for compatibility. Another strategy to support reducing lighting load is use of energy efficient lamps. So replacing incandescent lamps with energy efficiency lamps such as CFLs, LEDs, or HIDs will not only reduce the energy consumed by lamps, but also reduce the energy required by the HVAC. Approximately 90% of the power consumed by an incandescent light bulb is emitted as head rather than as visible light. So these newer lamp technologies improve the ratio of visible light to heat generation and also improve the lifetime. Also with regard to energy efficient lamps, I'm gonna talk a little bit about CFLs versus incandescent lamps and LEDs. So CFL's lifetime is about five to 18 times longer than an incandescent lamp. A CFL lifetime is typically 6,000 to 15,000 hours compared to an incandescent, which is about 750 to 1,000 hours. CFLs also consume only 20 to 30% of the total electricity consumed by an incandescent lamp. Quality CFLs have significantly improved and more categories are available in the market. So these CFLs may cost a little more upfront, but you can see that the energy savings over time are substantial. LEDs, quality has also improved. LED technology is still relatively new. Um, so conduct a thorough comparison and consider purchasing um, from more mature and high quality manufacturers. Reducing plug loads. So we recommend purchasing and using energy efficient office equipment. Because WRA's audience is global, there may be labels for your marketplace different than those that I'm familiar with, but I've introduced here the Energy Star label, which is widely recognized across the United States and is indicative of products that reduce greenhouse gas emissions and other pollutants. Um, these types of labels make it easy for consumers to identify and purchase energy efficient products that offer savings on their utility bills without sacrificing performance features or comfort. There are a number of office equipment product categories for Energy Star, computers, monitors, uh, VOIP phones, displays, imaging equipment, et cetera. And I've provided some links and resources for people to look further into these products and also identify labels um, unique to your own jurisdiction. 
So reducing plug loads, very simple here, turn off office equipment. So use the power management functions of computers when not in use, switch computers to standby or shutdown mode. This is gonna save a lot of energy over time, especially if implemented in large corporate offices. Another important measure is to use smart outlets. These outlets can eliminate standby energy consumption. So smart outlets can cut off the power of connected office equipment when it detects the shutdown of host computer at an individual station. Also supply power based on the actual needs. So two modes of power supply are based on need, based on needs are frequently used, either timer or occupancy sensor. Next category is decreasing infiltration, operating a building at a slight positive pressure. So this is a more complex energy saving measure, but again, has significant potential and can be implemented quite, quite easily. So you may have been into large office buildings. Sometimes these are these tall office buildings with large atriums. I know um, some of the buildings that I visited in Shanghai or New York fall into this category. Um, where there's a clear stack effect happen, happening, where the buoyancy of the warmer air creates a high pressure at the top of the building and low pressure at the bottom of the building. Um, and what that means is it's very hard to open um, doors or you've got a lot of infiltration, a lot of negative pressure coming in at the bottom of the building. Um, so the benefits of operating a building in a slight pos positive pressure include reducing infiltration of unwanted outside air, reducing energy consumption that would be required to condition, um, and improving control over the humidity levels and indoor air temperature. So questions to consider for um, when, when looking into whether a building needs to address infiltration. Have warning signs been experienced? Are doors staying open or are they hard to close? Um, or is there excessive air motion at entrances and exits? What about interior condensation? Is the building's pressure balance checked and controlled? So if any of these warning signs have occurred, we recommend um, seeking to improve um, the positive pressure balance in a building. So that involves improving the building envelope. Um, so improving the insulation ceiling of lobby elevator room, um, both on the top floor and the door to the outside, keeping the door to the side stairs in buildings closed. These measures are going to help buildings to, again, operate at a slight positive pressure and avoid infiltration of outdoor air and unnecessary conditioning by the HVAC system. A second component of this is managing kitchen exhaust hoods. So consider installing optical or thermal sensors in kitchen hoods to detect the heat and smoke load and run exhaust fans as well as make up air fans based on the need. This measure is gonna help circulate air on an as needed basis and avoid exhausting the conditioned air from other spaces. It'll also reduce the potential for creating a negative pressure situation in the building and cutting down on building energy usage. The third component of this is managing exhaust fans in a laundry room, if there are laundry rooms. So operating the exhaust fans in the laundry room according to the actual demand instead of running them all the time and ensuring the makeup air system is turned on when the fans are operating. Again, this is going to help avoid ex excess exhaust and also avoid directly exhausting the conditioned air from other areas, helping to maintain the building at a slight positive pressure. A couple of low cost pieces of equipment to support um, steps to operate the building in a slight positive pressure include a differential air pressure gauge to read the building space pressure and also a digital strain gauge to measure door closure resistance. So comprehensively, ensure that exhaust air dampers and air intake relief air dampers are functioning adjust the supply and return air differentials, fresh air intake volumes and exhaust rates to achieve a slight positive pressure in the building and maintain pressure conditions with a BAS or manually. We have a couple case studies of buildings that um, you know, face challenges related to slight, slight positive pressure balance and we're able to correct the condition and save significantly on energy usage and costs. 
Another important area of energy savings is related to economization. So you may get a recommendation in better to add or fix economizers. And here are a few things you can do at no and low cost. Utilize night pre-cooling, utilize free cooling, and clean and repair outside air dampers and bird screens. So first of all, what is an HVAC economizer? Um, there are primarily two types, air side economizers and water side economizers. Um, an air side economizer is shown in the upper right hand corner. Um, and essentially it's a duct and damper arrangement and an automatic controlling system that would allow a cooling system to supply outdoor air and reduce or eliminate the return relief air to reduce or eliminate the need for mechanical cooling during mild or cold weather. So it's sort of that hood um, you can see on the right part of the upper right graphic. Um, water side economizers um, essentially work by passing air through a coil cooled by loop water rather than the coil cooled by mechanical refrigeration. Air is drawn through the cool economizer and the heat pumps compressor is turned off. So these essentially are major energy saving, um, major energy saving technologies. If you've got economizers and they're working correctly, you can implement a couple of very important strategies. The first of these is utilizing night pre-cooling. So significant energy cost savings can be achieved by reducing chiller energy usage. Air temperature outside needs to be only a few degrees cooler than the desired indoor air temperature in order for this strategy to work. And it can reduce the typical spike in building startup energy demand since chiller operation would start later in the day. So to utilize night pre-cooling, pick a day when the previous night's temperature was several degrees below the building's interior set point and humidity was in, is within the comfort range. Several hours before occupants arrive, start the HVAC fans, not the chiller, to bring in outdoor air. And use the BAS to carefully monitor interior temperatures, chiller start time, and chiller energy use. Perform these initial measurements on several different days. On another day with similar outdoor air conditions, use the BAS to carefully monitor interior temperatures and chiller operation without pre-cooling using outdoor air. Compare the pre-cooling and conventional cases throughout the day to assess the potential for savings. Perform these measurements on several different days, experiment with start times, noting outdoor air temperatures and, stiller, and chiller startup conditions. Based on these comparisons, establish a pre-cooling criteria for your building. Use the BAS to automatically initiate pre-cooling when outdoor conditions meet the criteria. And continue to watch performance data so that energy savings can be verified and documented. For more information on how to implement this measure, you can visit the link and the source shown in the lower right. And this is an excellent strategy, again, to minimize the need for and use of mechanical ventilation. Free cooling is similar. So when outside air temperatures are lower than the interior set point, you can open your outside air, damp air dampers. Um, add an economizer algorithm to the BAS that turns on fans and opens those dampers, or create a plan for manually measuring indoor and outdoor conditions and opening dampers or activating fans when appropriate. Which leads us to the importance of cleaning and repairing outside air dampers and bird screens. Benefits, improves indoor air quality, improves economization, free cooling and night free cooling capabilities. Questions to ask, were the outside air dampers and bird screens cleaned recently? Is there a schedule for this cleaning? When was the proper operation of all outside air dampers last verified and if needed fixed? You can see from these diagrams on the left what happens when you've got dirt and debris built up. The efficiency of these systems declines significantly. So we recommend on a regular basis um, use warm soapy water to clean, remove dirt, debris from those outside air dampers and bird screens and lubricate these regularly to ensure they don't stick in place. This is a very, very simple measure that can save significant amounts of energy usage and cost. Category six, optimizing heating and cooling set points. 
So this involves resetting chiller coil temperatures, setting limits on room thermostats, and resetting condenser water temperature. So resetting chiller coil temperature. Um, as you all know, a chiller removes heat from liquid via vapor compression absorption refrigeration or re absorption refrigeration cycles. This liquid then can be used, circulated through a heat exchanger to dehumidify and cool air in commercial buildings. Water chillers can also, can water chillers can be water cooled, air cooled, and evaporator cooled. So I've got a couple of diagrams of these chillers on the right. Essentially what we're doing here in the resetting chiller coil temperature um, is, is our observations have shown that chiller coil temperatures are often set at the same temperature all year. So regardless of outdoor air temperature, whether it's high or low, chiller coil temperatures are the same. Um, we found that chiller coil temperatures can often be increased slightly and those chillers will operate more efficiently. Both demand reduction and energy savings can result from this very simple measure. So ideally, chiller coil temperature would vary according to outdoor conditions. So our recommendation here is to plot the relationship between outdoor and coil temperature, uh, excuse me, to plot the relationship between outdoor and coil temperature that maintains interior set point temperatures. So this is involving a little bit of experimentation by building and facilities managers, but essentially you're looking to keep an interior set point and you're just beginning to understand as outdoor air temperatures change, how do I need to adjust my chiller coil temperature to keep those interior set points? So once you've done this plotting and examination, you use this information to reprogram your BAS to automatically reset coil temperatures based on the outside air temperature, time or day, time of year, and or the building load and the building systems. If the BAS cannot vary coil temperatures, consider doing Consider a schedule that can be implemented manually. Set limits on room thermostats. So this was one of the measures implemented by the Urban Hotel, five-star boutique hotel in Shanghai that was carbon neutral. Um, most office buildings and hotels have in-room temperature controls available for occupants, but no limit on the range of temperatures that they can set. Um, so essentially, this unlimited range of temperature can result in HVAC system continuously providing heating and cooling because the set point temperature is unachievable, causing an excess energy demand. So how do we go about setting limits on room thermostats? Minimize the difference between the set temperature and the actual temperature, just reducing the unnecessary heating and refrigeration energy consumption. A reasonable adjustment range should be programmed to the room thermostats so something like 20 to 26 degrees Celsius, something like that. And again, the Urban Hotel Shanghai provides a great example of that. Reset condenser water temperature. I'm gonna skip over this one due to time um, because Natalie will be circulating the slides. Folks can take a look at these and experiment with these types of measures. Okay, HVAC. A lot of options in HVAC, and again, I'll touch on a few of these. If you get this recommendation, increase heating and cooling system efficiency, any or many of these can be applied in your building. So heating and cooling system use, so turn off heating and cooling coils whenever possible, particularly when switching between heating and cooling seasons to reduce the energy used by the HVAC system. So heating and cooling system use, choose the outdoor temperatures and the outdoor indoor temperature differentials that will activate the heating or cooling system. Determine which spaces will always need cooling regardless of the season and either automate on-off settings using the BAS or create clear facility management policies, policies for manual activation and deactivation of heating and cooling systems. This one is super simple and essential. Cleaning HVAC coils and filters, we've toured dozens and dozens of buildings and found that these HVAC coils and filters are filled with dust dirt and debris, which reduces the efficiency and the heat transfer property. So utilize dry cleaning methods for the coils and tenant spaces. Use an industrial vacuum cleaner and brush to remove all debris without water. 
the questions to ask when were HVAC coils and filters last cleaned in my building? Is there a schedule for this cleaning? How dirty were they at the last cleaning? Are dirty filters causing coils to be dirty? Another component of this measure is that fans consume energy to transport air through the filters. So once resistance before and after the filters increased, more energy will be consumed by the fans. So you can see in the table here that just by reducing the resistance within fans, you can significantly increase, excuse me, significantly reduce the energy consumed and save energy. So many of us are familiar with this in our, in our homes and apartments, et cetera. Next, inspect and repair the insulation of pipes. So benefits of insulation of pipes includes reducing heat transfer between the chilled hot water piping and the surroundings, which increases the load on chiller system, increasing energy usage. It also eliminates condensation forming on the piping. So inspect the chilled water pipes for broken insulation or signs of condensation and repair the broken insulation to avoid heat transfer to the surroundings. Inspect and repair duct leaks. Inspect, excuse me, check the ducts of the air distribution system and repair the broken joints and leaks and be sure they're insulated if, they're, if they run through unconditioned space. Air distribution systems are important parts of the HVAC system which provide indoor air comfort. So again, you can see here um, a duct that's broken. If the construction is not proper, the system has operated for years, the air ducts in hard to reach places may work improperly, which will reduce the efficiency and energy performance of the system. Okay, I'm skipping over a few of these due to the time limits that we have, um, but I will mention regulating boiler operation. Um, regulating boiler operation by scheduling operation of the boiler to match occupant hot water needs. Um, we recommend utilizing existing time switches and installing time switches. So very importantly, you need to understand your boiler's storage capacity, determine how long it takes for the water to heat up when boilers are switched on, determine how long hot water will remain available in the system after the boiler is turned off, Determine daily hot water demand patterns for monitoring use of hot water in 15 to one hour increments using the BAS. <clears throat> schedule the boilers to switch off during times of very low demand. After the schedule is programmed, check the, to ensure hot water is supplied to occupants at required times. <clears throat> Shut off boilers at a time that allows for enough stored water to provide hot water for the end of the business day. So a way to think about this graphically is that boiler operation should take into account utility rate schedules, um, delay boiler operation to avoid AM peak tariffs, try to operate your boiler during low peak, low tariff times during the midday, et cetera. Another important measure is to treat boiler water. Again, I'm gonna skip over this due to the time. Um, because the slides will be circulated, you can take a closer look at this measure. A few other management strategies we recommend are use of daytime cleaning and promotion of <clears throat> occupant awareness. Daytime cleaning should be considered in buildings with typical office hours where most space is unused after hours. Office space containing confidential or sensitive information requiring employees to be present while janitorial services are being performed are also good cases to apply daytime cleaning. So arrange for cleaning staff to work during typical daytime office hours, set building sleep hours, and develop pre-occupancy pre agreements for new tenants that can help shift existing building cleaning schedules from evening to daytime, thereby saving energy. Also important, promote occupant awareness. Develop a strategy for informing occupants of simple ways they can contribute to property management team's energy reduction benefits, both financial and environmental. Letters, emails from building owners to occupants, posters, et cetera, with tips are all great ways to inform occupants. 
the better operations checklist. So we've talked about a number of no cost, low cost O&M measures that can be implemented based on the 14 categories of energy efficiency recommendations and better. To help implement these measures, we've developed an operations checklist. This is essentially to be used by buildings and facilities teams to help implement all of the measures we've talked today on daily, weekly, monthly, semi-annual and annual basis. Buildings that have applied these checklists have seen significant reduction in energy usage and cost. Again, these are all simple measures. Very few of them require any upfront expense um, beyond purchasing of light meters or photo sensors at a low cost and empower staff to take action and guide them in taking action routine action that can save energy in buildings. So we'll circulate the uh, no cost, low cost O&M checklist following today's webinar. Some of the recommendations and better can't be implemented at no and low cost. A chiller retrofit may be in order or some other major retrofit of lighting or other equipment in a building. And in those cases, organizations are gonna need to procure energy services. We've included in this training some tips and best practices related to procuring energy services. Most of us are familiar with what an energy service company is and does. Um, it's hired to identify and oversee installation of energy saving projects and facilities. Many of the services that they provide frequently implemented in combination include audits, project consultation, installation of equipment, commissioning, assistance in securing financing, measurement and verification, equipment O&M, guarantee of energy savings assistance and working with utilities, renewable energy project development and design and third party project evaluation. The following are questions you can ask to determine if your facility might benefit from an ESCO. And some of the tips we um, have for hiring an ESCO include ensuring that you're evaluating price, payback period, the content of the service, including how the ESCO is gonna measure and verify the savings and the overall timing of the project. So we offer, again, some tips here, some things to consider in terms of the timeline for hiring an ESCO. Often the process can be longer than expected, mostly due to the negotiations of cost and savings. So I wanna take just a minute to talk about some of the um, core elements um, of an energy efficiency um, contract or financing contract, roles and elements. So in most um, cases, there's gonna be a host or a customer, which is the property upon which the measures are being implemented. There's gonna be the ESCO, which is the organization responsible for implementing the measures. The lender, which is the financial institution that will provide debt for a project. Um, measurement and verification. So that's the process of quantifying the energy savings delivered by an energy conservation measure. Also, a couple of types of savings arrangements, shared savings and guaranteed savings. So I'll talk about those in a moment. But in short, shared savings is an arrangement where an ESCO finances the energy efficiency investment and both the customer and the ESCO share the value of the savings. In a guaranteed savings arrangement, the ESCO guarantees a minimum level of savings that is sufficient to finance the full upfront cost of the project. Financing comes in two categories, traditional, which is methods such as credit cards, lines of credits, or unsecured loans. Also emerging are specialized financing measures and approaches. Um, an example of this would be in the United States, the residential property assessed clean energy financing which allows residential homeowners to finance energy efficiency through their property tax bill. Um, here's the basic model proposition with financing. Um, a lender will under identify the total cost of a project, the equipment, the installation, the maintenance, um, the debt service, so that's the principal plus the interest, and the host's anticipated um, savings. And 
we understand that energy efficiency improvements are going to result in some level of annual utility savings. And then with that information, a financier is going to determine the length of a contract or a tenor of the loan, which is going to be the total cost of the project divided by those annual utility savings. So you can see that diagrammed here. Also here is the energy efficiency financing landscape um, that, that we're familiar with currently, and we know it's evolving globally. But again, as I mentioned, there's traditional and specialized financing, traditional loans, leases, loans can be secured or unsecured, leases involve operating leases, capital leases, tax exempt leases, specialized financing is sort of an emerging area where I mentioned PACE, there's also on-bill financing, on-bill repayment, energy savings agreement. So perhaps in the future we can talk more about the different types of financing, but all of this rolls up into what we would call energy performance contracting. So the financing is delivered to these EPCs. How do EPCs work? Hosts will work with ESCOs to scope and develop an energy efficiency improvement plan across its facilities. ESCOs are going to provide upfront audits to determine cost-effective and available upgrade options. And ESCOs and hosts will sign that EPC agreement to implement the upgrade. And the ongoing services provided by the ESCO during the term will vary by project, but often include O&M, repair, service upgrades, M&V of savings. In exchange, the host will make regular service payments to the ESCO, in addition to repayments to the lender if the project was financed. EPCs may be designed to split the cost savings from the upgrade between the host and the ESCO, such as that the host realized savings are greater than the sum of the financing and ESCO payments over the term. This is the shared savings approach. And ESCO may also provide a guarantee to the host that a certain amount of the energy savings will be achieved. And if actual savings are less than this guarantee, the ESCO must fix the upgrade and pay for the difference, pay the difference to the customer. After the EPC term expires, the host stops making service payments to the ESCO and takes responsibility for maintaining the equipment and keeps all future energy savings. Here's a diagram of the shared savings model. And here we have the guaranteed savings model. To learn more about these EPCs, you can visit some of these resources shown here. I'm going to now talk briefly about measuring and communicating success. So once you've implemented better, you've generated your energy efficiency recommendations, you've identified a subset of these that are no cost, low cost, you've implemented them using the operations checklist, and you've tracked savings over time. Then you've identified some of these measures that require perhaps use of an outside service company and financing and taken one or more of the approaches we've talked about briefly here and i'm sorry we don't have more time i'd love to talk about those you then need to think about measuring those energy and cost savings and developing a strategy to inform stakeholders of the success you've had in energy performance improvement and we recommend two kind of cornerstones for sharing your performance improvement and that is to share your financial benefits and to highlight your environmental impact so when we talk about energy efficiency um, we often think about what are what are our bottom line benefits what are our ultimate energy cost savings um, and what is the increase in the net operating income of this building Energy costs are part of the operating costs of a building. If I can reduce those energy costs, I can increase net operating income. So I just wanna talk briefly about an important formula that can help us think about um, the outsized financial impact that energy efficiency can have on buildings. Um, particularly in the case of thinking about buildings as real estate investments. We, we are working with large private equity organizations and we're working with alternative asset managers that own lots and lots of real estate um, as part of their investments and those investments when energy is reduced in a building 
can have real positive impact on asset value. And it's the asset value that is the value, the, the, the value of the building in the marketplace. So three, three, three key points here um, to, take, to take away, um, three key metrics. So capitalization rate, this is the rate of return on a property based on the net operating income. In other words, the cap rate is the payback of capital on a property. Net operating income, as I mentioned, is the annual income generated by the property after deducting all expenses, including managing the property and paying taxes. And current market value of the asset, known as asset value, again, is the sort of the sale price in the marketplace. So private equity, alternative asset management companies really want to see that asset value increase. It allows them to buy a building at price X and sell it from a much higher price generating a return on their investment. So one of the ways to think about energy savings is that energy efficiency is gonna increase my net operating income. And my net operating income is gonna increase my asset value. So as a notional example, let's say we've got a company that's invested in 4.7 million square meters of real estate, and their energy costs are about $20 per square meter. A 10% reduction in energy costs would translate into an additional $9.4 million in net operating income. And at a going capitalization rate of about 6.5%, this could mean a potential asset value boost of $146 million. So really kind of thinking creatively about how we can communicate energy efficiency in financial terms. This is just one example that really resonates with, um, again, private equity, alternative asset management companies, and their shareholders. Um, because those shareholders um, see those returns um, within their pension funds and their holdings. Also, share environmental impact. So simply put, um, translating those energy savings into terms that will resonate with an audience, and I've given in one example here. Um, by 2030, we estimate that the Building Efficiency Accelerator will have assisted approximately 1,200 buildings in nine international cities to reduce electricity use by approximately 95 terawatt hours and avoid emissions of 107 megatons of carbon dioxide equivalent, which is equal to the CO2 sequestered by planting 1.7 billion new trees. Um, and then showing that in graphical format as well. So those are just a couple of examples. More resources are available at the Energy Star Communications Toolkit here. And with that, I want to conclude um, and also open it up for questions. Uh, thank you so much for your patience today as we went through a lot of material relatively quickly. Uh, Natalie will be circulating this um, PowerPoint and also the operations checklist to help BEA participants implement these measures in their buildings. Carolyn, thank you so much for this very detailed presentation and so much information. Um, I'm also very impressed you could talk for so long. So well done. <laughs> um, so I see we have one question now. If anyone else has questions, please uh, take these next few minutes to put them into the chat box, to the question box. I will circulate the slides. I I will also circulate the checklist, which I've added to our handouts in this presentation right now, so you can access it at this moment. Um, we have one question already, and it is for you, Carolyn. It asks, are there any ROI reports or studies for positive pressure retrofits in Latin America? Um, that is a fantastic question. Um, Offhand, I don't know, but I would love to look into that and get back to you. Um, I would assume that positive pressure retrofits or positive pressure, um, you know, balancing pressure in building is happening in Latin America. And I'll look to see if we have any case studies that can provide you with an example of how that was achieved. Um, I know we have one for China. Um, but I'll look to see if we've got one for Latin America. Excellent, thank you. And are there any other questions right now for Carolyn?
Well, seeing none, uh, no hands raised or questions posed, I will uh, take this moment to say thank you very much to Carolyn for this presentation and that I will be in touch following up on this webinar with the video recording, the slides, and the checklist PDF. Carolyn, is there anything else you would like to add? Um, I don't I don't think so. Um, just that uh, we hope the information in the presentation was useful. A lot of it is very dry. And my thinking is that when folks get the PowerPoint, they'll be able to read and review it. And we hope take the steps recommended and let us know if they're able to um, save energy in their buildings or if they run into problems we'd love to we'd love to offer advice um, on on workarounds if some of these measures um, prove, prove difficult to implement great yes excellent and um, Carolyn's contact information is on the slides mine will be on the email as well so uh, we also have a question if the checklist is available in Spanish um, it will be. Um, currently, it's just in English, but we're getting it translated. And when we deliver this presentation in Spanish on July 31st, we will circulate it at that time. We'll also, I think, um, talk to WRI about making the checklist available on the Better website so that people can download it either in English or Spanish from our, from our web application. That would be that would be great. Um, we have one one last quick question. Uh, does the better tool include the Middle East region? Um, yes, yes, it absolutely does. Um, better is designed to be implemented anywhere in the world where energy consumption uh, would be sensitive to outdoor um, to, to changes in weather. So absolutely, um, and we'd love to hear about how the tool works in the Middle Eastern region, you know, what what you see in terms of its um, effectiveness. But yes, it's designed to work anywhere in the world. So Middle East included. Wonderful. Excellent. And I, and I concur that, you know, sharing those stories are not only helpful for for us, for the tool, and also for the many cities and um, case studies that would be similar to your own. So thank you all for joining. Thank you, Carolyn, for this tremendous presentation. And um, I will be in touch with the link to the full presentation and video and the slides shortly. So thank you all for joining. Have a great day or evening. Thank you, Natalie. Take care. Bye-bye.